you have been lied to about Dawn of War 3. You have been led to believe that this game is truly irredeemable, that it's terrible to play, that it betrays the series lore, and is one of the worst RTS games ever made. Well, I'm here to tell you the truth. Dawn of War 3 is none of those things. In fact, I'd argue that it brings massive production improvements to the RTS genre, thanks to its MOBA DNA, and sidesteps irritating lore requirements and physical limitations to showcase excellent graphical fidelity while having fun with advanced reposition maneuvers and Terminator armor. Dawn of War 3 is actually fantastic, and it's a great game. It's been unfairly viewed upon to an insane degree, and I reckon it might just be the best in the entire series. Anyways, let's dive into why this game is so good. And why you need to send help and be held against my will. My location. <sighs> right. So, that was a bit of fun. But not everything I said in that opening was entirely false. I honestly do think that the perception around Dawn of War 3 isn't entirely justified. And for those who haven't played it, and have just listened to the discourse surrounding it, I think you have been lied to, or at least misled, about Dawn of War 3. Now, of course, I'm not going to spend this video saying that the game is perfect, and that everyone should go out and play it right now. It has issues, serious ones, potentially franchise-ending ones, but under all that, I do think that there's a game to enjoy here if you come at it with the right mindset and can look over its more glaring problems. So join me as we dive into the depths of why I think you have been lied to about Dawn of War 3. Now, while I certainly have some upcoming takes that a lot of you may not agree with about Dawn of War 3, my time with the game certainly wasn't all sunshine and roses. That's why it was nice for me to take some time over the past few weeks to sub it out for the sponsor of this video. Broken Lines. It's a narrative-driven tactical strategy game developed by Porterplay and published by fellow Australians Blowfish Studios over the ditch in Sydney, Australia. And it brings some interesting and unique mechanics that I haven't really experienced anywhere else. While it saw a Steam launch back in 2020, it's now just been released on Xbox One and Series S and X, as well as PlayStation 4 and 5. The game is set in an alternate history World War II, and it plays a bit like a bit of a hybrid between an action RTS like Company of Heroes, and a tactics game like XCOM 2. Its most distinct mechanic is how it handles its turn-based gameplay. Instead of measuring turns in actions, like similar games, each soldier's said actions instead take a certain amount of time, and they engage in combat automatically. So you basically queue up your commands, maneuver your squad so they can do their best work, and end your turn, which allows the action to play out uninterrupted for 8 seconds. Before a mission you decide on which troops to deploy, each of whom have special abilities, consumables like grenades and medkits, as well as passive bonuses. It's super fun and it can be pretty challenging, and I enjoyed the satisfaction I got from seeing a perfectly planned assault or flanking maneuver executed with brutal efficiency. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, then I'd encourage you to check it out. Like I said, it's just released on both Xbox and PlayStation, as well as it being on Steam already. Links for everything can be found in the description and pinned comment, and big thanks to Broken Lines for supporting the channel by sponsoring this video. And if you'd like to win a free copy of the game on PC, then simply retweet this in the next three days and I'll pick three winners. Dawn of War 3 came seemingly at the perfect time for Relic. It was announced in 2016, seven years after Dawn of War 2, and the fans were excited. Company of Heroes had been out for a few years at that point, and for the most part it had been thoroughly enjoyed by new and existing fans alike. As well as that, their most recent games had all been successes really. Space Marine was great and something new for Relic, and Dawn of War 2, excellent with its expansions ranging from good to average, depending on who you ask. Sure, maybe they weren't quite at the calibre of Relic's earlier games, from the 2000s, 
but considering the state of the strategy genre at the time, Relic was really one of the last bastions of reliable, big budget RTS developers, with the only other big player being left being like Creative Assembly? Blizzard was mostly MIA by that point, and otherwise it was really just indies carrying the torch. Except for the odd big name remaster or remake, and RTS adjacent releases like Anno and Paradox games. But despite their pedigree, Relic's reputation took a serious, near irreparable hit with the release of Dawn of War 3. In April of 2017, after months of hype thanks to a really good marketing campaign, and don't worry, we'll discuss that later, saying people were disappointed with the state of the game after they booted it up for the first time on their PCs would be an understatement. While critic reviews were fine, as they often are, basically every aspect of the game was criticised in one way or another by the fans. The overly saturated colour palette and disjointed presentation when compared to the game's marketing. The gameplay trying to cater to both Dawn of War 1 and 2 fans, but disappointing both. The lack of game modes, a frightening gameplay resemblance to MOBAs, the fact that there was only three factions, bugs, technical issues, and a new voice actor for Gabriel Angelos, I could go on. And we will. But overall, player feedback was immensely negative, and Dawn of War's image had been immeasurably tarnished. While there was hope that post-launch support and DLC could maybe turn the game around, as it has for a lot of games over the years, those dreams were put to rest, when Relic quickly and unexpectedly abandoned the game completely just 10 months after its release. The reasoning being that the game's performance was not meeting their expectations. That means it wasn't making enough money. This kind of behaviour was unheard of for Relic. Even looking past the desire to position Dawn of War 3 as an eSport, having Relic Entertainment, the company known for supporting its games for years with DLC and expansions, having them completely drop a flagship title from their flagship IP inside of one year was shocking. In their eyes, it was unsalvageable and they were better off just kicking it to the curb and moving on to their next project, which would hopefully be one that would provide a solid W and get the fans and shareholders back on their side. Anecdotally speaking, the public perception for Dawn of War 3 has not improved. If anything, it's decayed even further, with very possibly accurate claims saying that it has permanently killed the franchise and ended Relic's tenure as a developer of highly regarded RTS games made for those who love them most. So with all that being said, I hope you understand the risk that I'm taking here by coming here and holding the position of claiming that Dawn of War 3 is actually not that bad. At least not as bad as you might think. There's a lot more to it than that though, and trust me, I've got my points and I've got my reasoning. So here we go. It's impossible to even begin talking in depth about Dawn of War 3 without addressing the elephant in the room, the cinematic trailer. What some call the best visual representation of Warhammer 40k's grimdark setting ever, and what I call possibly the best Gondab cinematic that I've ever seen, besides maybe this one from World in Conflict. Imagine being excited for Dawn of War 3 and seeing this. I would have pre-ordered instantly and bought a copy for 10 of my closest friends if I had the cash for it. Scrawny space marines aside, this trailer's got it all. Visceral combat, a dark, serious tone, and huge new units that we've never seen in a Dawn of War game before. And if the game's presentation was going to be half as good as what we got here, there would be little to complain about. But instead, we got this. Bright colours, gaudy character models, campaign cutscenes that range from medium budget 
to no budget at all. Cartoonish, law and accurate animations. Did I mention the colours? The tonal whiplash going from this to this is enough to rend your spinal column in two. Where's this game? I don't want this. Give me that. Alright, let's chill for a second. Take a breather. Okay. What's really strange about the presentation is that, for the most part, the production values are really high. Aside from some of the campaign cutscenes, which do seem like an afterthought, most of the game looks visually really impressive, and it boasts a cohesive art style with great direction and distinction between its elements. Top to bottom, you can tell that all of this was created with obvious motivation, and in its own realm, the realm of Dawn of War 3, everything is cohesive and nothing feels out of place. Relic was clearly aiming for something here, and I reckon they hit the mark. And the animations really stand out too, building animations are the best that they've ever been in the series, and while they might not be lore accurate, seeing Gabriel do a triple front flip with his hammer just to slam lightning on his opponents feels weighty, and come on, it looks awesome. As does Solaria when she pops a flurry of rockets, or Taldir when she jumps and slams into a bunch of little foot soldiers. It's flashy, and by god it's got gusto. In a vacuum, I love it. The problem is that nothing is ever in a vacuum, and this is a Dawn of War game. And the game's marketing did nothing to imply that this is the kind of art direction and presentation style that we'd be getting. According to everything we know about Dawn of War and Warhammer 40k, Gabriel should not be able to do front flips in half-ton Terminator armor. The trailers don't show it, previous games don't show it, 40k lore doesn't show it, but here he is doing just that. It's a complete lore and tonal disconnect, and it sets a really terrible precedent for how the player is meant to perceive what the game is showing them. It's extra bizarre because the design of most units is very 40k, filled to the brim with skulls, golden emblems and massive weapons and armour. Though it too falters in that everything is just a little too clean, everything is shiny, there's nothing dirty or used, like these guys should really be scuffed up, especially as battles go on. Dreadnought should be covered in bullet holes and impact scars to illustrate their history in battle. Not looking like they just rolled out of the Imperium Gigafactory. Some of the campaign cutscenes do show a grittier version of these characters, more akin to the cinematic trailer. But outside of that, it's all unadulterated metal and fresh paint. At least it looks good in the army painter. I guess the question now is, why? Why did Relic take it in this direction? They clearly had the budget needed to make a game that looked great, so why was the saturation cranked to 100, and why were the animators told to throw the lore book out the window and just simply do what they thought looked cool? Honestly, I, I really can't say. Maybe they thought a more light-hearted tone would attract a wider audience. Who knows. It's clear that the trailer we all loved was commissioned before the art style had been finalised, because if it wasn't, then I have no idea how communication faltered to such a degree to where that could be produced while Relic was working on the art and designs that ended up in Dawn of War 3. And upon further investigation, it seems like this was almost certainly the case. So that trailer was made by Axis Studios, and in their description of their work, they say that it stayed true to the established Warhammer 40,000 and Dawn of War lore while continuing to push the boundaries of the art style. Inspired by the art of this guy, who I am not going to pronounce because I cannot, I can't say for certain, but it almost sounds like this was made with no reference to Dawn of War 3 at all, which would explain the disconnect between them. And it turns out that Axis made the cutscenes for Dawn of War 3 too, since Relic was so happy with their work on the trailer, and I understand why. And I do see the resemblance. But I feel like they're a little out of place in the campaign. I want to be here in the moment, I want to see these big events play out in real time, not in a 2.5D video. While they look cool, I don't think they're nearly as effective as simpler in-engine cutscenes would have been 
and keeping you engaged and in the moment. We'll talk a bit more about the story soon, but let's take a step back and discuss the campaign from the start. The way I see it, an RTS campaign needs to succeed in one of two ways to be considered great, and both to be fantastic. The first is having a compelling narrative, and the second is offering exciting gameplay opportunities through a multiple choice sandbox made available to the player. Think back to your favourite RTS game, where does it fall on that scale? Maybe the story's just fine, but the gameplay is great. Or the opposite. Or maybe, if you're Warcraft 3, it excels in both. Regardless, I think looking at games through this lens can help us judge objectively how good a campaign actually is. Of course there are other factors to consider, and you may adore a game that other people say is bad, for a myriad of reasons. But I'm trying to be objective here, so I'll do my best to keep bias out of it. So, Dawn of War 3, using this method, where can we place it? I think here, squarely average in both camps. Perhaps a little under on the story side. And before you start flaming me in the comments, let me explain. So the game is set sometime after Dawn of War 2, and sees the return of three factions from previous games. These of course being the Blood Raven Space Marines, the Eldar, and the Orcs. Yes, only three, the least number of factions at launch in the series. And can I just say, why is it always these three? 40k has such a vast variety of lore and different factions and races. Surely we could push the boat out a little here. Gabriel Angelos returns as the new chapter master of the Ravens, albeit with a different voice actor, who I think does a decent job in the role, but he's hard to compare to the original, who was just perfect. This is Gabriel Angelos, chapter master of the Blood Ravens. My space marines and I have deployed to the breach. This is the fate of traitors. Remember this, and do not stray. If you do, I will be ready to render you the same service. My boy Gorguts is back, leading the orcs, love to see it. And the Eldar are led by old mate Farseer Maka Macha, it's like a T, anyway. The campaign is split between these three factions, as they all converge to try and capture an ancient Eldar artifact called the Spear of Cain. And as you'd expect, there's a lot of fighting between them, as they all try and get it. Eventually though, it turns out that the spear is really just a vessel to awaken a big old demon sleeping under the ice, you know, these things happen, and our three heroes are forced to team up like the Avengers to defeat it. It's a fine concept, that if it done right, could lead to a great campaign, but unfortunately its elements just aren't all that well executed. Having the missions be segmented between the three of them is not a bad idea, and it's been done well before, but having them jump around from one to another as often as they do, in some cases fighting on completely different sides of the same battle right after one another, leads to it feeling disjointed and a little aimless, especially in the first half. And if you're new to the game, then there also isn't enough time to get used to how each faction plays, or how the heroes function, when you're constantly swapping between them. Which is actually a bit of a backdoor compliment, because the asymmetry between the factions is surprisingly quite good. Thanks to a bunch of unique mechanics, as well as unit variety, and the abilities of the game's heroes. Which it calls Elites. Elites can range from particularly powerful squads of units, like a Space Marine kill team, to individuals like Gorguts or Jonah Orion, to powerful single units like Dreadnoughts or Wraith Lords. Each are centred around a particular playstyle, and they all have their own abilities, strengths and weaknesses, not too dissimilar to the main units in Dawn of War 2's campaign. Each faction gets up to three at a time, and you can choose who to fill each slot at the beginning of each mission. Unless the campaign requires you to take certain ones. Which can be an issue, there's one time in particular where Knight Solaria saves your ass in this grand moment mid-campaign, which would have been a cool reveal if not for the fact that the pre-mission selection screen completely spoiled it by showing her as a mandatory elite in the deploy screen. Regardless, the elites give each faction a lot of personality, combined with the faction abilities that are available, playing each of them is quite different to one another. 
Space Marines, for example, can deploy drop pods with units of your choice onto the battlefield. Eldar can teleport their buildings, basically at will. And Orcs get access to scrap heaps, which can be used to build mechs at a significantly cheaper rate. Oh, and they get WA, of course, too. Once you're comfortable with playing each faction, the campaign becomes a lot more enjoyable. It starts slow, and the first half is really noticeably worse than the second, for multiple reasons. There's the lack of familiarity I talked about, which certainly doesn't help, but the story also just doesn't have much to do or say, except try and awkwardly get these factions like pointed at each other, and to explain why they're all in the same place again. What is this, the sixth time? There's also a noticeable lack of cutscenes, with the story being delivered primarily through these terrible pre- and post-mission PowerPoint slides with a few lines of dialogue as you watch through them. There are occasional higher budget ones, those ones created by Axis Studio, but they're few and far between, and you can actually see them denoted in the game's campaign mission screen. Mission design is also pretty bland. The first few are glorified tutorials, which hold your hand far too much, and the others are vapid without any real stakes or incentives to continue. This is more noticeable when the level's visuals hint at deeper mechanics, like traversing through tunnels or achieving a height advantage of your enemy, only to have it just not be a thing, you just can't do it. So you can imagine my shock when around the 10th mission, so just over halfway, it got better, like a lot better. Missions were becoming more interesting to play, with exciting scenarios, real stakes in the narrative, faction familiarity, some proper on-the-ground cutscenes, and a more free-form approach to missions that allows a lot more agency when it comes to your units and elite strategies. The best ones are when you have your base, a goal, your choice of elites, and the freedom to just go about it as you see fit. And these become more frequent as you get deeper into the campaign. Going back to our scale here, I think the first half of the game is probably like this, but the second half, it's proper good, no joke, more like this. Not including the final mission, which might actually be the worst final mission I've ever played in any game, I had a really great time playing the last few big expansive levels, with all the toys and actual investment in the story. Here's a great example. Near the end of the game, the secondary antagonists have been defeated, and it's decided that the big three need to team up to defeat the demon and his chaos spawn. So, there's this big multi-layered mission where you control all three of them one after another, where each faction does their part to reach the final showdown. And it's decided that the only way to fight this demon is to crack open the planet with Gabriel's ship requiring loyal Captain Balthazar to drive it into the ground and give his life for the Emperor. I'm not gonna lie, after fighting tooth and nail for over an hour, then having this play out, I got actual chills, man. All drivers arm. Battle barge Dauntless beginning crashdown approach. You'll need a signal to guide Dauntless down to this fault line. A trio of listening posts will serve. The demon can shield Acheron from much. But not from the Dauntless itself. Not from me. Not from me. Go with the Emperor, Captain. But then you have to fight the big man, and wow, this mission totally blows. The first half is fine, you're controlling all three heroes alone at this point, so you're using your abilities, putting into practice what you've learned throughout the game, clearing out chaos mobs as you fight towards the demon. But once you get there, you just chip away at his health bar as he constantly spawns enemies to attack you. And all the time, he's just jumping around, firing these insane fireballs at you and flame walls that do massive damage and frequently healing significant portions of his health back. Not only is this fight boring and repetitive, it's utterly infuriating thanks to the constantly attacking enemy mobs that require your attention. Pulling you off the demon and dragging the fight on and on and on. 
Also, no points for originality, guys. Can we get a Dawn of War game that doesn't end in fighting a big red demon? Thank you. The game also has the gall to drop in a post credit scene teasing the arrival of the Necrons. <sighs> Which of course never happened. That really aged like milk, huh? Where are they, Relic? Where are they? Overall, the campaign is a lot better than I thought it would be, I'm not gonna lie. Especially once I got through the first half. I really can legitimately say that I enjoyed it, and I'd recommend you give it a try if you're interested. But in saying that, the way Dawn of War 3 is built leaves some significant inherent flaws in how you play a lot of the missions that drag the whole thing down. And this is mostly down to the fact that the game often can't decide in whether it wants to be a, a Dawn of War 1 style base building RTS with lots of units and a generally fair player versus AI mechanics, or a Dawn of War 2 style tactics game where you have set units and an appropriately balanced and predetermined enemy force that stands between you and your goal. And I think I can best explain this by comparing this particular mission in Dawn of War 3 to this one in Impossible Creatures, another relic RTS from the early 2000s. At their base level, these levels <laughs> are similar. Both have a three stage setup, with a final boss accessible after completing two objectives. And both have you set up with a base simply with the goal of eliminating the enemy. Simple, right? In Impossible Creatures, you've got two enemies and their bases on either side, with the big bad deeper into the map. And in Dawn of War 3, you've got two key structures to eliminate, again, both on either side. And then after that, that unlocks a final showdown deeper into the map. Technically a bit different, but functionally pretty much the same. So, Impossible Creatures plays like a traditional base building RTS, because that's what it is. And your enemies are on the same footing as you when it comes to mechanics, for the most part. You're both harvesting the same resources and building units at the same rate. And the game is obviously balanced around this. This is important because A, you know what your enemy is capable of, and B, you know victory is possible by virtue of you utilizing your resources and overcoming them in a fair fight. Now, let's pivot to Dawn of War 3. You would think that it functions the same, being that the setup is basically the same. You're building a base, you're training units, and then you're fighting, etc, etc. But the difference is that, like I said, Dawn of War 3 is trying to mix that base building style with Dawn of War 2's curated missions where you trust the game designers to balance the level with preset unit numbers to match your available resources. And this manifests itself in incredibly annoying ways. In Impossible Creatures, you know that if you, say, take out all of the enemy's creature chambers, they won't be able to build any more creatures, right? Makes sense. So you make a strike force, you snipe their buildings, then you pick off whatever's left with another strike. You know you've got two enemies left, and you can change your plan accordingly. You cannot rely on strategies like that here because the game will just spawn in waves of enemies from nowhere, regardless of what structures they have left or how far you've progressed through the mission. You cannot reliably build your armies to a certain size and expect to win because you have no idea what is going to be waiting for you, and what the game is just going to snap into existence. This worked in Dawn of War 2 because you knew that the game designers knew that you'd only ever have four units. They would never make encounters to where it was impossible to overcome them with what you had. But here, you can have anything, ranging from a huge army of squads to just three elites alone. But because of how you cannot dependably guess or assume the size of the enemy force, it ends up with you just building an army, attacking, making some level of progress, and getting wiped due to some unforeseen enemy spawns that are impossible to predict, and repeating until you make it to the objective. In Impossible Creatures, once you take out that first enemy base, the number of hostiles you're facing has been cut by a third. It is quantifiably less. It's now going to be easier to take out the second guy, because the first is no longer a problem. Dawn of War 3's mission is nothing like that, because the enemies that spawn seem to be irrelevant to your mission progress. 
Ultimately, the reason why this mission in Impossible Creatures is fun, but infuriating in Dawn of War 3, is that in the former, you know your enemy's capabilities and you can plan and strategize accordingly using the game's sandbox. But in the latter, you have no idea what's going to pop out from thin air, so it's impossible to plan anything. Your agency is utterly gone. It's boring, repetitive, and it's plain frustrating. Most would approach the scenario in Impossible Creatures in their own way, and each would have a story to tell on how they did it and what strategies they used to complete it. And I doubt the same could be said for Dawn of War 3's mission. There are some missions that stick close to Dawn of War 2's formula, with a set selection of units and enemy encounters designed around your capabilities, and these work great. But there are lots more where the game gives you a base and tells you to eliminate the enemy. And those inherent flaws in encounter design and enemy expectations can make some of them very, very annoying. Lastly, this seems like as good a time as any to lament the missing features from previous Dawn of War games that would have helped to add a lot more depth to the three core. Things like unit veterancy and a morale system are just nowhere to be found, both of which I think would have a significant impact in making the regular units feel a lot more important, because as it stands they often pale in comparison to the elites that they fight alongside. And I think most would agree that they're a little too squishy in combat, they just kind of tend to die. The same goes for suppression and cover systems, with the former being completely MIA and the latter being totally gutted and relegated to these weird capture points that erect bubble shields at precise locations. These may not be as noticeable to begin with, thanks to the micromanagement that the game asks you to do to use your elites effectively, and your regular units to be honest. But when you look at it, infantry combat here is as one note as it's ever been in the whole series. If you take two squads of units from earlier games and put them in a fight, there's morale, unit veterancy, equipment upgrades and cover all to consider, and all of them play a role in that engagement. Here there's maybe one ability per squad, uh, maybe a unit upgrade depending on the type of unit it is, maybe stat upgrades from the faction's single research building. It's very shallow. And if it weren't for the elites, I would be ragging on Dawn of War 3's combat way more than I am right now. The bugs don't help either, and despite the game being 5 years old and after a year of patches, I still ran into issues pretty frequently. Nothing game breaking, but still pretty annoying. Right, let's see here, um, we've got disappearing buttons, we've got units stuck on terrain, we've got game elements being in cutscenes where they shouldn't, and we've got this lovely one where the game needs to be restarted basically every time I begin because I can't get through this menu when I unlock something. Fun, great work. When Dawn of War 3 launched, it came with only uh, one multiplayer mode, Power Core. A lot of people weren't exactly fans of this, as you could guess, because Annihilation had been a staple mode in the series since it began and it really did reinforce the idea that Relic were maybe a little too cool for classic RTSs, and were simply just aiming for the MOBA crowd. Annihilation was added in one of the game's few post-launch updates, so now we have a total of two game modes to play. Three if you count the Annihilation variant, which is Annihilation with turrets, and I don't count that, it's the same mode. That's poor, and the lack of options pales in comparisons to RTSs of old. This isn't actually in the script, but I'm currently playing Crossfire Legion, and that game has lots of modes, uh, and that's made by like a much smaller team, and funnily enough, uh, people who used to work at Relic, so... Mm. Okay, back to the script, I had to restart the teleprompter. Okay, back. So, surely it wouldn't have been hard to add even a simple, like, capture and hold the point mode, or a king piece mode? I mean, the elite system is basically made for a king piece mode, right? Just give every faction, like, a fourth elite that's with you from the start of the game, and if they die, game over. The lack of modes is compounded by the fact that there are no alternative or extra ways to play, like, at all. And yes, I ragged on the last stand in Dawn of War 2, but at least it was there. I mean, hell, you've got all the components here for a MOBA, just make a MOBA mode with creeps and heroes for some variety, at least it's something. Anyway, the modes we do have... The two, the two of them, 
when you get down to it, are very similar. Personally, I actually like Power Core more because it tends to give games purpose by setting clear goals and objectives. And at the end of the day, both modes are asking you to basically do the same thing. You're building the same set of few structures, capturing and holding resource points because it's a relic game, and making your way to the other side of the map to kill the enemy. But at least core requires you to put in a bit more thought and strategy into how you're going to actually do that. And yes, I've heard all the complaints about how it's like a MOBA, which yes, it is a little bit, but not that much. And like regardless, like I don't I don't care. Like if it's fun, it's fun. Whether it leans towards and takes some aspect of other genres, it's not really a huge concern for me. But yeah, I get it, I guess. So yeah, the modes are boring, but the factions are not. All the same toys are available to play with from the campaign, but having them accessible at your whim, while also being pretty customizable, is, perhaps surprisingly, great. Your chosen elites really do affect your playstyle, and I found a lot of satisfaction in deciding how I wanted to approach the game through them and my army doctrines, without the limitations of the campaign. The meta surrounding the elites is actually my favourite aspect of this whole thing. It really does add a significant layer of depth to what would otherwise be a fairly bland skirmish mode, thanks to all the little choices that they require you make along the way. Obviously, the big one is who do you even take? They're all geared to certain playstyles, some being crowd control specialists, others being tanks, some are like hero snipers, you know, you got the idea. And they've got their associated costs, so you could, say, choose to take three elites that are all five or less elite points, and you could deploy them a lot quicker than an opponent who had chosen a 5, 7, and 10 cost elite. But they'll clearly have more powerful heroes as the game progresses, so it's up to you to focus on winning the game quickly before you are inevitably outmatched. Other choices crop up during the game too, like when do you even deploy your elites? The logical wind would say as soon as you've got the points for it, but that's not always the best idea. Maybe you want to save them to deliver some crucial AoE damage when they drop. Or maybe you want to ensure that you have a particular elite at full health and out of harm's way before a crucial push. There really is a lot to it, and thanks to the sheer number of them, and with each having their own abilities and specialities, it makes for a fun experience that I'm genuinely surprised didn't click with more people. Yes, Dawn of War 3's attempt to mix the best of both previous games wasn't a great success overall, but I do think that it's here in multiplayer that it gives its best showing. While the factions are quite asymmetrical, especially thanks to the elites, the fact that there's only three of them really does hurt the game's variety and longevity. And I do wonder that if Relic had stuck with it a bit more, maybe added in the Necrons that they'd teased, as well as like, the Tau? Chaos? Really anyone? It might have drawn enough of a crowd to gain some traction. But unfortunately, we will never know. Looking back at all three games and their skirmish modes, I personally would rank them like this. I know that a lot of you will disagree, but Dawn of War 2's multiplayer really did bore me to death. And what Dawn of War 3 offers is way more compelling, at least for me. Base building, while limited, kicks it up a couple of notches, but the elites really do put it above and beyond what I played in Dawn of War 2. The original is still the GOAT of course, but if you're looking for a genuinely fun 40k RTS to play with some mates, at least for a little while, then I reckon Dawn of War 3 isn't a bad choice, all things considered. You will need people to play with though, or be happy going solo against AI. Because as of writing this, the player count barely hits three digits, sometimes not even. And I couldn't find a single open multiplayer game throughout the entire four weeks that I was playing and writing for this video. Honestly, I was shocked at how few people were playing this. It's less than even Iron Harvest and Command & Conquer 3. And it's a joke compared to anything in the Age of Empires camp. At least it's higher than Command & Conquer 4. Although, that might be the absolute lowest bar any game could claim to clear.
Overall, I think Dawn of War 3 is a perfectly serviceable game, with great production values and some fun and unique ideas. But as the third entry in a beloved series that promised a grimdark setting and a return to its roots, no, by those standards, it's not good. So what the hell happened? How did Relic miss the mark so badly? And how did the public shift so much against the game to what I think is past the point of what it deserved? Well, I think it's because they missed the mark that an unstoppable snowball of criticism would grow against it. And the expectations players rightly had, thanks to the game's marketing and what Relic was saying before release, had primed the player base for disappointment. We got people excited about uh, the return of Dawn of War 3 with that story trailer right. several weeks ago, and now we're actually showing off gameplay, and that's that's really exciting. People are very happy so far. Warhammer 40k universe is very grimdark, it's very <laughs> gray. Mm -hmm. There's lots of, you know, the space brains, you know, you think nominally they're the good guys, but the emperor, who they all serve, he sacrifices a thousand citizens a day to stay alive. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, the Dawn of War fans out there know this. They got me at base building. The minute they said base building, I'm just like, Sold. Uh, can you uh, say how many uh, battles, how big the battles can be, how many squads, units are we talking about? Ooh. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> no. I love the base building aspect and I love the, the, the zoom back scale and this even brings it farther back. I love how it brought back, I love that classic feeling of Dawn of War 1 where there's a lot going on at the same time, everything is rushing, everything is just mayhem. Yeah, it really reminded me of the original Dawn of War which I love and, and still love to this day so it's so cool to see that tradition you know and we had a lot of success with dawn of war one with the sort of large scale of battle mm. and base building and with dawn of war two we sort of went in a different direction and had a lot of success with the uh the heroes mm. and uh what we found was they kind of appealed to slightly different audiences so when we we're talking of dawn of war three um, and what we could do we thought you know what spectacular battles, spectacular large scale battles they're a lot of fun mm. uh and we want to return to that but we also wanted the heroes so we sort of took those two elements and put them together we're adding new mechanics as well to kind of gel it all yeah. it better. But yeah, that's the kind of direction we're heading. Large scale battles with elite heroes that are very clear for players to understand and, and devastate with. We're yeah. seeing some base building. This is something that wasn't in Dawn of War 2 because it was yeah. more company hero style. So talk to us about base building. What's interesting about it? And why did you decide to bring it back from Dawn of War 1? Well, you know, one of the things we wanted to bring back from Dawn of War 1 was the scale of battle. And so when we were looking at it, the best way of doing that, delivering on the scale of battle was you know, by letting players choose which units they have on the field. And the way to do that was with base building. What you just saw there was the way the Space Marines build their bases. Rocket drills into the ground. Awesome. Looks really like very industrial, very, very Space Marine-esque, very like, you know, the 41st millennium, you know, dark stuff war. Um, so here. I honestly think that if Dawn of War 3 had always been positioned as something different, with appropriate marketing, that it genuinely would have performed better. Possibly even to the point that where some post-launch DLC would have come around to improve it even further. That of course wouldn't save the game's other issues, but it could have been enough to change its fate. But the discourse and perception had become so negative, so toxic, that it really had no chance. The player base was determined to hate Dawn of War 3. And if you disagree, let me ask you, have you actually played the game? If so, and you've reached the conclusion that it's legitimately terrible, then fine, more power to you. But for the others, and I know you're listening, how many games have you tried that everyone said was just the worst thing ever, only to find your expectations challenged? You'd watch the Crowcat video, bashed on the game in your Discord, only to play it and think, Hold on, this isn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. Cyberpunk, Battlefield 5, Mass Effect Andromeda, Dawn of War 3. Games crushed under the weight of their own hype and expectations, but are ultimately fine games. Some make it out alive, and some don't. So where does this leave Dawn of War then? Is the series cooked for good? Will Gabriel Angelos get another shot in the spotlight? Or is it all over? Man, I honestly don't know. Never say never, but I'm just not sure all the stars could align to bring a series like this back. And who would make it? Relic? Would they even want to? Sure, maybe there's a universe where they pull it all together, 
and deliver the game that fans are hoping for, or at least one that most people can agree is a great entry that does the series justice. Good job, woohoo. If I was a betting man, I'd say if we don't see any life in the series within three years, I don't think we ever will. By all accounts, Company of Heroes 3 is shaping up well, but how that game lands will almost certainly determine the future of Relic as a company. If they can bring it together and deliver a game that's really great, then perhaps they will have the confidence to try Dawn of War one more time. And hell, maybe even Sega will let them. But if Company of Heroes 3 is a flop, even to half of what Dawn of War 3 was, then a sequel to a down on its luck franchise will be the least of Relic's problems. We'll have to wait and see how it pans out. While we're here though, why don't we come up with some hypotheticals for another situation. Let's say that Sega wants to bring Dawn of War back, but Relic either doesn't want to or Sega wants a different developer to give it a go. In an ideal world, who would develop Dawn of War 4 and what would it look like? Here's my take. Starting with the developer, I honestly think King Art Games, creator of Iron Harvest, would do an awesome job. While I certainly had some issues with that game, one thing I loved was its heavy, gritty presentation. Units had weight, the mechs were imposing, and having that style be transplanted into the setting of Warhammer 40k would be awesome. Plus, I think they would have learned a lot since releasing Iron Harvest, to the point where a lot of the gameplay issues I had would hopefully be resolved. That's my hope for this made up situation anyway. Gameplay wise, I think my perfect Dawn of War 4 would, maybe not surprisingly, be kind of like 3, with a few key changes. Firstly, more of a focus on base building like the original I think is crucial. Like that first game, we need the ability to dig in, to reinforce forward positions, and in my opinion, we gotta slow the game down a bit. And the musical chair control point game really grates on me after seeing it in nearly every relic game ever made, as well as in Iron Harvest. I do think the big hero units can stay, though more customization in their individual abilities and loadouts a la Dawn of War 2 would be nice. And I also think that the divide between hero units and regular ones needs to be shrunk a bit. Lastly, I'd like to request more factions, units, and buildings, as well as a reduction in the reliance of control points as resource and population limiters. Some is okay, like Dawn of War 1, but having everything be tied to them, in my opinion, is not conducive to a great RTS experience. We could go into a lot more depth here, but this video is getting really long, so let's stop there. We can continue in the comments. If you're interested in hearing more on a hypothetical Dawn of War 4, then I'd highly recommend Poncha's video on the subject, which a lot of you have probably seen in your YouTube recommendations at this point. It's a great video. Ah, that is a coincidence. He's actually here right now. I personally feel both of my Dawn of War videos are a bit of a mess, but I posted them at a time I was just getting into YouTube. If I could go back, I probably would have done them a bit differently. Dawn of War 3 itself was an okay game. It had a campaign, multiplayer, and very little bugs as I remember on launch. The issue was is they had Dawn of War in the title. If it had been called Warhammer 40k MOBA, the game would have been fine. With the name Dawn of War in the title, you have fans from both 1 and 2 expecting a sequel to their game, and Relic decided to go for a mixture of both with a MOBA twist thrown in that nobody wanted. On top of that, it had one less faction at launch, no annihilation mode, last stand, and very little base building. They weren't catering to either fanbase. And that was one of the biggest disappointments of the game, the fact that they were trying to grab the attention of a new audience whilst not respecting the one they already had. If we ever do get a Dawn of War 4, the game just needs to go back to its roots and keep it simple. Gameplay from Dawn of War 1, graphics from Dawn of War 2 or better, a couple of super heavy units thrown in there, and the game would probably sell very well. I'd love to hear your ideas too, so if you've got a great idea or a concept for what the future of Dawn of War could look like, or should look like, then let me know down below. Oh, wait, I just realized it's obvious Relic is actually working on Dawn of War 4 right now. How could we miss the signs? Well, this video went for a lot longer than I expected. Truth be told, 
I was going to this review and I was ready to accept that Dawn of War 3 is a bad game with zero redeeming qualities and I was legitimately expecting an easy video that wouldn't require a whole heck of a lot of critical thought. I didn't expect to write an 8,000 word video essay nearly as long as my entire review of Dawn of War 1 and its three expansions on why the game is not what you think it is, and how a frankly okay game can be completely ruined by mismanaged marketing and the weight and expectations of its player base. And I'm not saying that players were in the wrong here by the way, far from it. They were right to hold the expectations they did as that's what was implied with the game's trailers and pre-release interviews. But that's not what they got. Ultimately, the tale of Dawn of War 3 is a tragic one, and you can tell that Relic tried here, they really tried, and the effort they put in is apparent throughout a lot of the game. But then there are parts that are woefully undercooked. The campaign story has nothing on previous games, and its mission design mostly falls flat to the point where a lot of it feels like an afterthought to multiplayer. It's only when you get to the latter half of the campaign, the point where most players would have just checked out, as evidenced by the game's Steam achievements, that it manages to turn itself around and become a genuinely enjoyable experience. But the principal sin of Dawn of War 3 is its lack of respect to both the series it's part of and the universe it's based off. People will forgive a lot of things, but contempt for what made them fans in the first place is not one of them. And I think that, combined with the game's myriad of other issues, is really why Dawn of War 3 crashed and burned as hard as it did. But despite all that, it does do a lot right. The elites are fantastic, there's proper base building, factions are diverse and fun to play with and against, and the production values are high, they're really good. I was talking to a friend recently, and he told me that he wasn't a fan of Dawn of War 3 saying that it wasn't a proper Dawn of War game. And I simply responded with, well what even is? Dawn of War as a series has always tried new things, introduced new mechanics, and had each release strive to be different from the last. Dawn of War 1's expansions added entirely different campaign styles, Dawn of War 2 pivoted the entire series to focus on tactics, and Retribution mixed the formula up again with its campaigns. Dawn of War 3 is simply a continuation of that, of trying new things. At the end of the day, Relic attempted something different here, aiming for a hybrid of the previous games while also adding new things of its own. And even if you hate the game, you've got to respect that. My point is that Dawn of War has always been a series in motion. It's always been fluid, changing with the times to reflect the audience of the day. And while some entries are of course better than others, I do respect Dawn of War 3 for what it was trying to be. It's not the best game in the series, no, and it didn't entirely stick the landing, not by a long shot. And as an RTS, it's average at best. But it was unfairly shafted due to its marketing, and the expectations that existed because of it. And it made a game that probably would have found an audience in uninhabitable toxic wasteland. And that, my friends, is how you've been lied to about Dawn of War 3. If you've made it to the end, thank you. This ended up being an absolute monster of a video that took a long time to make. So if you have enjoyed yourself, then a like on this video and a sub to the channel would be hugely appreciated. Seriously. And if you'd like to go even further and support me and what I do here, then you can do so by becoming a member either here on YouTube or over on Patreon. And you'll join living legends like Eero, Krizzy218, George Rain, Jack Walsh, Nutty Jawa, Overlord Jeebus, T Edits, Crispy Robo Chicken, XV204, Dekayo, David Debolli, Wintendo, Bad Ghosts, Sean Weber, and Johnny Woof, who supports me at the Paladin tier. Thanks very much, mate. You know I appreciate it. And as part of the Patreon benefits, at certain tiers, you get to ask me a question at the end of the video. So, Johnny Woof asks, There are a lot of visual styles for various RTS games, where the graphics are realistic or stylized, and so are the units, buildings, etc. What's your favorite style of visuals where you can just immediately tell what's up, what each unit's for, and what each building is supposed to do? 
I know we talked about this a little bit in our, our Discord gaming session, which you can be part of by joining the Discord, by starting up on Patreon. Um, but I think my favourite game in particular has got to be Warcraft 3. Just the art design in that game is so good and the unit and building design and distinction is just perfect. You can tell what every unit and building is just by its silhouette. The animations are great and they're all very distinct and very obvious for what they do. You know, the Rifleman has a huge rifle and it's very simple rifle coat that's all other games that i think do it particularly well the original command and conquers are pretty great with that kind of 2d art style having very recognizable buildings is very important um, and i think they nailed it and the same probably for like age of empires one i think does an excellent job with like the storage pit the granary you know the barracks all these are very distinctive buildings and it's a very clear art style that you can just look at and see okay great and I think they did something great with the units too, and like the unit icons, which are very distinctive. And I think that's something that Age of Empires 4 really fumbled with, was the uh, unit and building icons are not distinctive at all. And looking at any of them, you have no idea what they are uh, without really squinting or really knowing what's up. So I think that's kind of a fumble of modern game design, and I wish we kind of could go back to that um, more stylized art of uh, unique uh, images and models and uh, buildings for, for games. So that's my answer. Thanks again for the support, and thanks for the question. And that's that. Thank you very much for watching. I am recording this literally on the last night of editing. It feels great to have this video nearly, nearly done and out there. But as far as you're concerned, this video is over. So go enjoy your day, your night, wherever you may be. And I will see you all next time.